This episode is made possible by the realistic online game War Thunder. Check out this game through the link in the description below. Go through that link. Not only do you support this show, but you get a free premium tank or boat or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus. And let's get into it. A peaceful, unnamed town is taken over by an unnamed army. The invaders arrive by surprise, aided by the treason of an insider, the scheming shopkeeper called Coral. The traitor seeks recognition from the new masters and appointment as new mayor, but he is despised and put to the side by both the occupiers and the townsfolk. The locals, under the moral leadership of Mayor Auden and the town doctor, gradually wear down the morale of their enemies. At first, they do it with passive resistance, but this gradually evolves into sabotage and the killing of soldiers. This is the plot premise of The Moon is Down, a novel by celebrated American writer John Steinbeck. The novel was published in 1942 as an explicit tool of propaganda. It was translated into several European languages and distributed clandestinely across occupied Europe, where it inspired local resistance movements against the Axis. After the war, Kin Hakon VII of Norway awarded Steinbeck a medal for his service. The Moon is Down does not mention any location, nor the nationality of the characters, but the inspiration is is clear the German occupation of Norway. And the man who inspired Coral is one of the most infamous traitors of all time, Vidkun Quisling, the man who sold his country to the Reich. Vidkun Abraham Loritz Jonsson Quisling was born on the 18th of July 1887 in Telemark, Norway, the son of a Lutheran minister and a well-known genealogist, John Loritz Quisling. In his youth, not interested in continuing the line of eight consecutive pastors, he decided to join a military academy instead. In the 1920s, with the rank of major, Quisling was sent to Russia as a military attaché to the Norwegian embassy. During his mission, he worked with Fridtjof Nansen, a well-known explorer, diplomat, and recipient of the Nobel Peace. Peace Prize. The two documented the terrible famine gripping the Soviet population as a result of the Civil War and early Leninist reforms, and they also participated in the relief effort. This experience left a deep impression on him, a distrust and a fear of communism and the consequences of a mismanaged socialist state. He also collaborated with the British, helping to mediate with Moscow on behalf of their interests, and this earned him an appointment as a CBE, a commander of the Order of the British Empire. Upon returning to Norway, Krishling decided to leave behind the military career for a political one. He served with the Agrarian Party and was appointed Defence Minister, a post that he held from 1931 to 1933. In those years, the Great Depression did not spare Norway. As in many other countries in Europe, the economic crisis brought about the spectre of political violence. Ever more fearful of a communist takeover, in June of 1931, Quisling sent the army against a union strike. His and the government's heavy-handed tactics they did not gain very much support. Eventually, the government it fell in 1933. Cushing had ambitions to create his own party and gain power. Looking for inspiration, he looked to Germany. On the 17th of May, Wittgen Quisling and state attorney Johann Bernhard Hodroth formally founded the National Samling or National Union. By the way, I, I haven't apologized yet, but I must hear for my Norwegian pronunciation. I looked them up when I can. It's pretty tough. This was modeled after the ruling parties in Germany and Italy adopting their trappings. Members used the Roman salute. They formed a paramilitary guard called the Herd and decked in uniforms adorned with eagles. Even the party emblem was a sort of swastika-like symbol. The National Union's program was decidedly nationalistic and anti-communist. It included a total ban on strikes, the elimination of unemployment, and the sterilization of undesirables. There were three main differences from the Nazi party that had inspired them. One, Quisling and the National Union never adopted socialism, an ideology which was at least at the roots of the ruling parties in Berlin and in Rome. Two, Quisling never made anti-Semitism a part of his plans. And three, National Union tried to retain ties with Christianity. After six months from the foundation, the National Union was put to the test, running for parliamentary elections. It was a total disaster. The party gained only 2.2% of the vote and got zero seats, doing only a little better than their communist rivals. At the 
following elections in 1936, the National Union did even worse, having alienated much of their Christian electorate. But not everything was going wrong for Quisling. While attending a conference in the German port of Lübeck, he met Alfred Rosenberg, leading ideologist and foreign policy advisor to Hitler. Rosenberg saw some potential in Quisling and introduced him to several military and political top brass in Berlin. And just like that, the ties with his future masters were being established. After the start of the war in Europe in September of 1939, it became very clear to Nazi leadership that for a substantial war effort, they needed more iron and more ships. This was an opportunity for Quisling. Norway it could offer both. In December of 1939, he returned to Berlin and made a proposal to Rosenberg. He would stage a coup d'etat in Oslo, install himself as Führer of Norway, and invite a German landing. In support of the plan, Quisling offered to Erich Reider, commander of the Kriegsmarine, details on naval agreements between the Norwegian fleet and the British Royal Navy. On the 14th and the 18th of December, Quisling met with the Führer himself, who granted German military support for his coup. In Quisling's schemes, the German military presence would not be an occupation, rather a garrisoning of his country to deter an Allied landing. Unbeknownst to him, the German High Command intended to take over Norway much earlier than he expected. On the 3rd of April 1940, Quisling traveled to Copenhagen for a meeting with German secret services, during which he handed over even more military intelligence. Six days later, Germany invaded. Quisling was taken by complete surprise, but he took some initiative and decided to proceed with his coup. Seizing the public radio officers, he declared himself Prime Minister and asked for Norwegians do not resist the Germans who were there to protect the country from an Anglo-French invasion. The invaders immediately recognized his collaborationist government, but King Hakon VII of Norway was not of the same opinion. He declared Quisling's government to be illegitimate and fueled the resistance against the Wehrmacht, even after his eventual escape and relocation to Britain. According to World War II law, German commander General Nicholas von Falkenhorst prepared the invasion of Norway in a single afternoon with only the help of a travel guidebook. The invasion started on the 9th of April, opposed by both the Norwegian and British Royal Navies. They opposed the German landing fleets heading for Bergen and Trondheim, succeeding in sinking 12 German vessels. But to Luftwaffe air superiority, it convinced the British Admiralty to cancel further attacks on German landings at Bergen. In the meantime, the Norwegian army was preparing to fight the invaders. To a demand for surrender, the Norwegians replied, We will not submit voluntarily. The struggle is already in progress. However, the Norwegian army it was ill-prepared. Units moved inland to take advantage of the rugged interior, but the German progress it was fast. By April the 20th, 11 days into the campaign, the German army had advanced 180 miles from Oslo. The first British troops, led by Major General Mackesy, had landed at Harstad off Narvik on April the 15th, a strategic port for the shipment of iron ore. The force it was ill-prepared and ill-equipped, meaning Mackesy took its time to finally move to Narvik in May. Meanwhile, the Norwegians had to fight alone against Germany's skilled mountain troops of General Geitel. A second landing expedition at Trondheim, supported by Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill, had been cancelled and replaced by smaller forces north and south of the city. The British, alongside French and Polish forces, clashed with the Germans with heavy casualties on both sides. But the expedition it was doomed for failure. The troops involved had little to no air or artillery support, plus they had no training of mountain warfare in a cold climate, unlike Dytel's units. On the 28th of April, the British commander in Trondheim, General Paget, he ordered an evacuation. And this, by the way, is where our friend Adrian Carton de Wyatt made his escape. You can check out our biographics video on him. If you haven't seen that one yet, it's a good watch, if I might say so myself. After Trondheim, the forces in Narvik, they were left to hold back the Germans, but by the end of May, the British cabinet decided for a total retreat. Losing the whole expeditionary force to the Germans would have spelled disaster in terms of loss of men, equipment, and morale. King Haakon of Norway embarked with his government on June the 7th, heading for Britain. By the 9th of June, the campaign it was over. The Norwegians had suffered 1,335 losses, killed or wounded, which was 2% of their army. The Anglo-French and Polish allies lost a total of 2,402 soldiers, and the Germans lost 5,660. These may appear to be a small campaign compared to others of World War II, but the Norwegians and their allies they held out for two months against a German invasion longer than any other country except for the Soviet Union. The campaign had major political consequences in London with the resignation of Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and the appointment of Winston Churchill. But getting back to the story today, what were the consequences for Vidkun Kriesling?
While the fighting raged on, the Germans realized that Kreisling, despite his reassurances, had lost control of the situation and the country was far from being pacified. The leader of the National Union was eventually sidelined and the Germans installed a trusted man in Oslo, Joseph Turbevin, appointed Reich Commissioner for Norway on the 20th of April 1940. Kreisling's plan it was crumbling. He had a grand idea of him as the leader of an independent Norway, albeit under German military protection. The appointment of Trabevent would have put his country under direct German control. After the capitulation in June, the parliament it was dissolved. In August, Norway became a part of the Third Reich. But Chrysling was not completely out of the picture yet. Turbevin saw some use for him, at least as a local figurehead. The Commissar installed Chrysling as the head of a puppet collaborationist government, and he proceeded to form a cabinet in the autumn of 1941. But it was clear that the one pulling the strings would be Turbevin all along. He proceeded to issue a series of proclamations, all of which were approved and countersigned by Chrysling. These reforms they included consolidation of one-party rule, the revocation of freedom of speech, and the introduction of rationing. In that same year, Kreisling and Turbevin welcomed a visit from Heinrich Himmler, who had come to oversee the creation of the SS Nordland Division. This was composed of Norwegian and other Scandinavian volunteers who pledged allegiance to the Reich and fought under German officers. Shortly afterwards, on the 21st of June 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union began. And on this occasion as well, Kreisling had grand plans to shine and to prove his commitment to the struggle against Bolshevism. His idea was to create a legion of volunteers to support the German war effort against the Soviets. But Turbevin, he was quicker, and he beat him to it. He created a unit of volunteers similar to the SS Nordland, but larger in scale. A skilled politician, the Reichskommissar, placated Quisling by reassuring him that the new legion would swear allegiance to him rather than any German authority. The volunteers would also be allowed to wear Norwegian uniforms, have their own officers, and would only see action on the Finnish front. Kreisling had no choice but to play along, and he urged all Norwegians to join. The Legion counted 1,200 recruits in total, many from the Hurd, Kreisling's own paramilitary force. Eventually, Turbevin pulled the rug under Kreisling. The volunteers were issued SS uniforms, were made to swear an oath to the Führer, and were sent to the toughest spots of the main Russian front, including the Siege of Leningrad. After suffering heavy losses, the remaining soldiers displayed poor discipline and fighting spirit, at least according to the SS high commands, but really, who could blame them? The Legion was eventually disbanded, and this spelled another failure for Quisling. His idea of contributing to the direct fight against communism had first been hijacked, and then it had ended in defeat. What's worse, his already thin base of supporters had been depleted by the onslaught of the Eastern Front. Now, good news in the online game War Thunder, you don't have to worry about your soldiers not having discipline. They're just digital people who carry out your whims like you're some sort of god. Which is nice. War Thunder is today's sponsor, and the best way for me to show you that game is to play it. So let's jump over to the computer. All right, everyone, welcome to War Thunder. I'm just getting right into it today. We are Germans. Uh, well, actually, I'm British, but we are playing Germans. This is a. Uh, I don't even know what tank I'm on. I had a convertible one before, and it just got completely destroyed. You never want to play convertible. I don't even know what that's for. It moves really fast, but this guy's also pretty nippy. This War Thunder, I'm playing as ta the tank game. It's kind of my favorite, but this guy plays as a plane. You can also play as a boat. I imagine not in this scenario. There is no sea. Tanks are a great place to begin. Also, begin with arcade. You can play arcade or realistic or simulator. I always just stick with arcade. It's kind of fun. You just jump in. If you get take the game a bit more seriously, though, definitely play, uh, definitely explore those other game modes. Loads of tanks, 1,200 vehicles in this game. Uh, not just tanks, of course. Uh, last time I played this map, I got stuck in a hole, which wasn't brilliant. Just stop, 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 stop. Back it up, back it up. Don't go over this. Okay, now we're ready. Target just Oh, what? I got them. Uh, but then someone got me back pretty much immediately. Look at this. This bullet will fly in. I love this effect. It reminds me of that snipe. Oh, wow, he really got me. Crew knocked out. And by knocked out, they mean, you know, they're, they're in bloody pieces. Uh, but fortunately, this is just a video game, so we can respawn. This is War Thunder. It's a great way to support the show. It's a lot of fun. It's free to download. So why not just go give it a go? Here's the convertible tank. So that's War Thunder. Sign up using the link below to get that free premium tank or boat or aircraft and the premium time. And let's get back to it.
The account we've painted so far shows it as if Kriesling was the only Nazi sympathizer in Norway at that time. The reality is actually pretty close. Novelist and journalist Arne Skoen, a former member of the resistance, in fact estimates that only 2% of the population were supportive of Kriesling and the Germans. But the Norwegian Prime Minister could count on the support of some heavyweights, most notably the novelist Knut Hamsen, one of the giants of Norwegian literature. Hamsen had won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1920. In the mid-30s, his support of the Nazi party became incredibly vocal, to the point of donating his Nobel Medal to Joseph Goebbels. At the beginning of the invasion, one of his articles read, Norwegians, throw down your rifles and go home again. The Germans are fighting for us all and will crush the English tyranny over us and over all neutrals. Out of the remaining 98% who did not like Quisling, many were involved in the resistance against the occupiers. Sometimes this manifested in actions of civil dissent, but then escalated into acts of sabotage and assassinations. These were coordinated by the Milorg, or Home Front, a resistance movement with 40,000 members at its peak. In addition to the Home Front activities, ordinary citizens did everything in their power not to yield to the occupation. It became common on public transport to stand up as to avoid sitting next to a German or a known collaborator. The Germans took this issue so seriously that they issued a decree prohibiting to stand on public transport if seats were available. An underground newspaper describes very clearly the purpose of civil dissent tactics. What the Germans suffer most from here in Norway is the coldness they feel from the people and their exclusion from contact. Let them feel this chill to their very marrow. The underground press was incredibly active, peaking at 300 different newspapers and magazines. The government retorted with a 1942 decree that announced the death penalty for perpetrators of anti-party sentiment, even in private writings such as diaries. As the Norwegians tried to distance themselves from the Germans, the Germans were trying to get very close, especially to Norwegian women. One official SS document stated, It is expressly desirable that the German soldiers conceive as many children as possible with Norwegian women, regardless of whether it is within or outside the bonds of matrimony. This was part of the Liebensborn program, whose aim was to breed as many Aryan children as possible. In Norway, 12,000 children were born to these unions, some consensual, most were forced by the fear of consequences of not complying. Sadly, women involved with German officers did not have the sympathy of their fellow citizens and could get their heads shaved or be branded with swastikas. This hostility continued even after the war. Many of these 12,000 children were ostracized and often sent away. Interesting fact, one of them fled to Sweden to escape this fate and achieved worldwide fame with her art. You may know her as Frida from the band ABBA. Several young men and women from the home front escaped to Britain, where they were recruited by the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. This army of secret agents, commandos, and saboteurs had been instituted by Winston Churchill with the mission to set Europe ablaze, in other words, harass German occupation forces throughout continental Europe. The first operation of the Norwegian SOE commandos took place on the 21st of March 1941. Their target? The Lofoten Islands, home to the fish oil tanks that were needed for the production of explosives. The operation it was a success especially from a propaganda point of view. A newsreel of the time shows the commandos sending a mocking telegram to Hitler from the islands. It read, Herr Hitler, reference your last speech, I thought you said that whenever British troops land on the continent of Europe, German soldiers will face them. Well, where are they? The same newsreel shows the rounding up of Germans and Krieslings for interrogation. Krieslings here, of course, meant local collaborators, and it's telling how already at this stage of the war, Wittgen Krieslings' name had become a synonym for traitor. On the 1st of February 1942, Wittgen Krieslings was appointed as head of state, in addition to being head of the government which sounds like a rather empty ceremonial title that was simply bestowed upon him to keep him happy. He even had his head on a stamp, but the head of state was still the king, and the reins of government were held by Turboven. Throughout 1942, the commando raids in Norway they continued, mutually supporting an ever-active home front. Their most famous action was the destruction of the Telemark plant, a research facility for the production of heavy water, which was part of Germany's research effort to develop nuclear weapons. A little known fact is that a previous raid by an all British team had failed, with six commandos being captured. Kriesling, humiliated by the successes of the SOE in the home front and urged by Turboven, authorized their execution. These were formal POWs, they were uniformed British soldiers, they weren't spies. 
Their execution it was a war crime, according to the Geneva Convention. In the same period, Kriesling imposed or simply authorized measures to enforce harsh martial law on the population. One of these measures was the forced registration of all Jews in June of 1942. In September, all Jewish property it was confiscated. On October 25, 1942, Jewish men over the age of 16 were sent to Auschwitz, followed by women and children on November 25. Of the 770 people deported, 740 of them were killed in the extermination camps. Only 12 returned after the war. Chrysling went from cruel blunder to cruel blunder. In 1943, as head of state, he formally declared war on the Soviet Union and instituted mandatory conscription. 75,000 young Norwegians were called up to arms. Many served in the ski units in Finland, but the majority were sent to work for the German war effort as part of the compulsory labor service. Compulsory labor was extended to women in 1944. When a popular chief of police, Gunnar Ellefsen, refused to prosecute two girls who had dodged this unfair draft, Chrysling demanded that he be put to death. These efforts to ingratiate party leadership were all the more futile as it was clear that the Allies were going to win the war. On the 18th of October 1944, Soviet troops crossed the border to Norway. This was the first page in the last chapter of Vidkun Kristling's sad existence of failed ambition and treason. The Soviets were not interested in pushing southwards. They instead established a bridgehead where Norwegian soldiers under the government in exile staged a landing. In January of 1945, Christling was invited to Berlin to meet with Hitler. During the meeting, he proposed a desperate plan. He wanted Norway to regain its independence in order to form an alliance of Nordic and Germanic people. He also proposed to the Germans to build a fortress Norway. In other words, use his own country to stage the last stand of the regime against the Allies. After all, at this point, Norway was home to some 400 thousand German troops. Both proposals, unsurprisingly, they were rebuffed. After Hitler's suicide on the 30th of April, Admiral Karl Donitz succeeded him as Führer. One week later, Donitz summoned Turbevin. Knowing him to be a fanatic, he dismissed the Reich's Commissar, handing over the duties to General Bohm. On the 8th of May, German forces in Norway capitulated. The home front immediately secured control of the country. On the same day, Turbevin blew himself up with a hand grenade. On the 9th, Norwegian police arrested Kriesling in his Oslo mansion called Gimli. According to Norse mythology, this was the home of the survivors of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, the end of times. Kriesling was put on trial with other National Union collaborators. His charges included treason, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and embezzlement. The prosecuting attorney asked him if he had, in his speeches, expressed the viewpoint that the Jews are guilty of a number of the misfortunes that have stricken the world. Kriesling did not flinch. Yes, that is my absolute conviction. His initial indifference to anti-Semitism had obviously changed during the war. All the evidence was against him. Christing's defense was that all he had done he had done to protect Norway from German rule. But proof of his secret meeting in Denmark one week before the invasion, well, it sealed his fate as a traitor. Vitkun Kriesling was executed by firing squad on the 24th of October, 1945. <music> So what is the legacy of Vidkun Kriesling? He left no children, and his name is now synonymous with collaborator, with a traitor who sells his country to his enemy. His career may have started with the intention of protecting his country against the Soviet threat, but when he made contact with the Germans, all he wanted was recognition and power. With his incompetence and his false promises, he alienated his German allies. With his fearful ruthlessness, he alienated his own country. The irony is that even without his scheming, Germany would have probably invaded Norway anyway. Its resources, they were just too precious to their war effort. So what would have been of him in that case? Well, let me go back to Steinbeck's novel, the one I mentioned right at the beginning. In it, Mayor Rawdon is forced by the invaders to cooperate. They want him, not the traitor Coral, to be the front of their decrees and orders, to become the legitimate face of their power. But he refuses to cooperate. If the soldiers want to play dirty, they'd have to do it on their own. When the resistance intensifies and the officers threaten reprisals, the mayor refuses to put an end to it, whatever the consequences. Maybe in other circumstances, Vidkun Quisling could have been an Orden. In our history, well, he chose to be a Coral. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this four times a week. And hit that bell when you hit that subscribe button because that actually lets you know when we put out a new video. So that is cool. And as always, I'll see you next time.